Hello, everyone. Welcome to our May 18th meeting. Um, today, we have the pleasure of having the uh, Lee County Clerk of Courts, Linda Doggett, come speak to us about tax deed sales. Um, she's a graduate of Hodges University, and she's been the Clerk of Courts since November 2000. Or she was elected in November 2016. So, I'll... thank you. Okay. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm actually on my second term unopposed the second time around, so I've been the clerk for just a little over four years in Lee County. And um, so we're just really excited about everything we do for our citizens. Um, I know the federal courts and the state courts have been doing a lot of electronic stuff for many years, um, but we try to do as much of that as we can at the local level, at the county and circuit court level. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of things uh, before we start talking about tax details, which is one of our responsibilities. Um, we have a lot of different responsibilities at the clerk level. Not all of them are court related. We're also the chief financial officer for the county where we create the financial statements um, for Lee County, the Port Authority, and the clerk's office. Um, we pay all the bills and payroll and all of that stuff. Um, where the minutes to or the um, clerk to the board of county commissioners, we keep the minutes of the board meetings. All of those are online, searchable. Uh, if you ever need to know how commissioners voted or see the backup to a commission meeting or any of that, um, that is all on our website. We also um, we do something that I just want to mention uh, with guardianship cases. Of course, guardianships are filed with our office, and we're responsible for reviewing the audits and the budgets and the audits. Um, and we now do guardianship um, auditing with the actual, with our auditing staff um, that we, you know, have, we also audit the county departments for fraud, waste, and abuse and um, various things. Um, so we have expanded that to now do guardianship audits um, with that staff where we can actually do investigation, subpoena financial records and that kind of thing. We work very closely with our judges um, and that in that service so that we are auditing, so that we are uh, investigating potential um, cases where there's potential fraud in terms of, you know, financial mismanagement and things like that. Um, so we do have a hotline. We have a anonymous tips on our website. We have a hotline phone number, um, all those good things for folks to report it. But most of our audits come through just the um, review of the cases and the reports that are submitted by guardians. Um, so, um, you know, we, we audit both professional and um, non-professional guardians. Family members are usually the ones who need um, more education and, you know, reminders to keep up with the things that they're reporting that they're supposed to do. So we do a lot of things um, like that. We This tax deed sales is one of the little offshoots of our official records office. Our, uh, well, actually, it used to be. I guess it's not anymore. We kind of, we kind of moved it over to where we do foreclosures because it very, it's very similar to the foreclosure cases and the processing of foreclosure sales. So we thought since we had this, we've done this recently, this, um, this uh, informational um, presentation about how the tax deed sales work. We thought we would give you some of that great information. Um, but before I do that, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the court cases. We recently, um, I guess not too recently, last year, we uh, had a, an order from the Supreme, Florida Supreme Court that said we could put the documents of court case for court cases online to the public for public viewing. So prior to that order, um, we were not allowed to put those documents online unless uh, they were online to attorneys, but not to the general public. So um, in that role of providing records online, and especially court records, um, and, and also official records actually, uh, we are responsible for redacting, for keeping confidential information confidential. Uh, protecting that information. <clears throat> so it's kind of a big role and there are a lot of aspects to how that happens. 
Um, but one of the ways that um, in the court system that that happens is that um, attorneys, when they file something with confidential information, are required to file a notice of confidential information, and in that notice they direct the clerk where that confidential information is located and we can redact it so that we have both the original non-redacted version of that document as well as the redacted version of that document. So the redacted version is then available for public viewing um, and the non-redacted version is available for the judges. Um, this past legislative session there was a House Bill 441 that, that passed, and I think we're now just waiting for that to be signed into law, um, that would be effective July 1st, um, when that does get signed into law. And um, the, the problem that we've had with our notice of, of um, topics mixed up, <laughs> with our um, notice of confidential information is that, hi, good afternoon. Um, so the problem with it is that we can't reject a filing. Anything that comes to our office, we have to file it in the, in the record as long as it is on the correct case. If it has an incorrect case number, then it goes back to the, that information being corrected. But generally, we have to file everything. So whether it had that notice attached to it or not, if it had, even if it had confidential information, we're required to put it in the, in the file and then you know, kind of on our own trying to protect that confidential information. Um, so, so we had, you know, now with these records available to the public, we're having more and more of an issue with those, some confidential information being available. We have to work with law enforcement, we're working with our state attorneys, public defenders, and all of our attorneys, just make, trying to make sure that we're getting the information we need to make sure, sure that those redactions are done properly. Um, so the House Bill 441 that passed, Basically, we asked for this bill because it helps us, um, helps really protect us a little bit to, to help us make these records more available to the public without um, so much of a delay. Right now, we have a delay in those records. Um, what happens is the public goes online to look at records and they, um, you know, they'll pull up a case and they'll want to see some documents on that case and there'll be a little lock next to the document that basically says you have to ask your clerk to review that document for confidential information. It's called view on request. So they request it, they wait two or three or four days or five days depending on how much volume we have and how many clerks we have available to do that job and then they get a notice, oh it's ready for you to see. You can now look at that document, it's been redacted. We're trying to reduce that, not only the workload but the liability if we miss something. Um, so, um, and actually I'll just let you know, in Lee County, for our records here in Lee County, we still have attorneys utilizing our old system. Our new uh, public access system is a pilot and it's open to the public, but we have the old system up for the attorneys so that they're still, they're not waiting on those VOR documents. Um, so when we do move out of the pilot phase into, you know, where everything is, uh, is a, a approved by the Supreme Court that we can take everything to its life status, um, then that will go away and then all attorneys will be in this, what would they call the security matrix, where if you're not the attorney of record, you're going to have to wait to see the redacted document. So, um, so that's part of the reason why we're trying to reduce the, time, the wait time and the workload because once we add the attorneys to the mix, we feel like that's going to slow it down even more and we don't want our attorneys waiting because they... Um, you know, have a job to do, basically, and they're trying to decide if they're going to take a case and, you know, now they have to wait two or three days to see, to look at the case records to see if they want to take that case. And so that just doesn't make sense, especially when they have to fill out this notice. So anyway, it doesn't make sense to me, but... Um, so the, the uh, House Bill 441 basically says the clerk is not liable for the release of information that is required. Uh, required by the Florida Rules of Judicial Administration to be identified by the filer as confidential if the filer fails to make the required identification of confidential information to the clerk. So basically we're just saying, you know, if somebody doesn't file that notice with us and we don't redact something, we're not liable for that. And we're just, you know, again, trying to reduce that liability and that cost to the clerk as we put these records out online for the public. 
So, um, so of course, I'm, I hope everybody's familiar with our website. I don't know if you utilize our website in your role, um, in, the, in the various roles that you perform at you know, the different levels of court, but if you do, um, I hope you find that we have enough electronic services. We are always trying to expand that. Um, mostly that is for our <coughs> citizens who need our services to pay fines, traffic tickets, um, you know, uh, f submit compliance documents, what, you know, all of the, all of the various things that uh, we, the services that we provide to the citizens. We just have so many different things. So we're trying to upgrade that website to make that easier, to expand that to our citizens so they're not having to come downtown and stand in our long line. Um, so some of the things that, of course, we have um, e-filing, we've had e-recording. Um, I think a lot of folks don't know that you can electronically record into the official record. You don't have to come down to our office to do that. Um, we, that is very um, popular with title companies and some construction companies. Um, and then we do the foreclosure sales and the tax deed sales, and those are also online. And um, we're gonna, we haven't done a foreclosure sale presentation. We're kind of looking for a partnership opportunity with the Lee County Bar because when we give these presentations, we get a lot of legal questions. And as you know, the clerk is not allowed to provide legal advice. And even if we know the answer, we're, we know, or, or have an opinion as to what someone should or shouldn't do, we're not going to be able to provide that by law. So we're, so we're trying to, you know, to partner with some attorneys that might, you know, want to be in the room and kind of field some questions and give some advice. And, you know, we always say, you know, you should get an attorney for that. And so maybe there's some attorneys in the room can say, well, and I provide that for you. <laughs> and here's my rate. So I don't know. I mean, it just seems like um, a good partnership opportunity. But because we haven't actually done that yet, we don't have a, a, a presentation already set up for the foreclosure sales. But again, they're very similar to um, the tax deed sales. Um, and I think even in the a sense that um, a bankruptcy would stay the actual case. It would, it would prevent any further, uh, we would pull it from a sale. If it was in the middle of a sale, we would pull it from sale and just let it sit and wait. So, um, so that, you know, that interaction with the bankruptcy court is very, the timing of that can be very critical if something is um, on, the, on the list to be sold and that sale starts, um, it goes very quickly because it's all automated. So um, Richard is here with me and he, I'm going to turn this over to him unless you have questions for me. Um, any questions? Okay. I have one question. Yes. So under the new system, the attorneys are going to have to wait to get Documents yeah. on cases that are not turning a record. Correct. So that is, you know, there's a there's an administrative order from the Florida <laughs> Supreme Court that talks about this online access to the public of these court records, and attached to that order is a matrix of who can see what, and so there are attorney of record. You know, they have different roles: attorney of record, judges, the public, the anonymous public, registered users. Um, and various state agencies are on this list of roles. Um, and I think there are 15, 20 roles. I can't remember exactly how many roles there are. And then across the top of this matrix are, what can you see? Is it, you know, um, um, some examples are um, confidential, like uh, sexual violence cases or uh, family cases, probate, you know, various levels. The statutes really lay out various levels of security for the different case types. So we go through this matrix and we've, you know, had to automate all of this who can see what stuff. Um, so, um, so right now, you know, we're, we've piloted that. We've programmed this complex security matrix into our system and as people register, they tell us what role they fulfill and we put them in the system and then we test to see what they actually get access to, whether we've done it correctly online. So that's the pilot that we're in. Um, and, but we just, we, you know, we've left the old system and our old inquiry system was for attorneys. It was for the public as well, but the public could never see any documents. Um, 
but attorneys could just pull up documents on cases because they're attorneys and you know in my opinion that's fine they already have the you know the the um, responsibility to know what's confidential and to file that notice so um, so they're still on the old system and they could sign up and use the new system but then if you're not the attorney of record on a case you're not gonna you're gonna be seeing the little locked symbols on documents and you're not gonna be able to see those documents unless you click the request and then the clerk wait the two or three days for the clerk and to respond. When will the change overview? I don't have a <clears throat> good date for that yet. I'm um, still testing. Okay. As long as possible. <laughs> <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> yes. Then the, old, then the old system will go away at that point. It will. It will. Because the Supreme Court does specify that we, you know, we must, everybody must comply with the matrix. It didn't give a specific time frame. It gave a process of um, you have to pilot and test and test for at least 90 days and get a Supreme Court approval of your test results. And we just haven't applied for approval. We've been test, kind of testing and checking our results and, and fixing some things that we find. Um, and we do, you know, we find things that aren't in the matrix. Uh, that do give you pause. There will be there will be documents. For example, the sheriff's office filed uh, booking reports with us with witness names or undercover officer names in the booking narrative, and then it was a very high profile case. So the so the media immediately pulled up the, the documents as soon as they could, and you know started seeing information they shouldn't be seeing, and then you know eventually we get notified. Um, and we're, you know, then we're like, well, we we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to recognize a witness name. We don't read the narrative. It's not a role that we're required to perform. Nor would we know that that's specifically a, a protected witness or an undercover officer. So we then we have to go back to the sheriff's office. We pull those documents offline as quickly as possible. We go back to the sheriff. We get the redactions done. But then it's an education process with agencies who file with us. Make sure you just don't, either just don't put it in the record that you're filing, or you know, or tell us what to redact. You know, one of those two scenarios. Um, but in general, we're not having too many problems with our matrix. But we are finding that the more you put online, it's good and bad. It's very convenient to the public. It is their record, so they you know they love to have access to that. But the bad side is there's a lot of personal information out there, and we don't catch it all. I know like a lot of times we'll get a call and say, oh, I got sued, and it's, you know, can you look it up? Mm -hmm. And I, I look it up, and then, you know, you can see the complaint and what's going on. Yes. So under the new system, I wouldn't have that immediate access to a, Correct. Like a you know, contract dispute? Correct. You would, you would see it was locked, and you would have to request to see that document. Unless it was already reviewed. Unless someone had already redacted it. Um, so you know that. So that's why I, re, I I'm really stressing, and I'm I'm trying to get our association to file a statewide media release that says once this bill is signed into law, that reminds attorneys file that notice of confidential information because the more you do that, then those documents will then already be redacted, and so you won't have to wait to see them. So in general, it should work. So but the presumption is that it's that. all confidential unless somebody asks to see it. The presumption is that we don't know if it's been properly redacted. We don't know that there's whether or not there's confidential information that, and that oh, those redactions okay. have been made. So, the, so then the review process takes place. Sometimes there are things there that need to be redacted. Sometimes there aren't, but we have to look at it for this administrative order and then put it out there for so you. Every so. document. Just about every document. There are some document types that we know would never have confidential information like service documents. Yeah, we we file service, um, uh, and even some of those, I guess, are to comp folks who have confidential, you know, are confidential to the case. So there's just there's just a lot of things. There is a um, a judicial rule 2.42 uh, or 2.4 something that uh, lists all the types, all the different confidential either pieces of information or complete documents, depending on what it is, that we have to redact, review, you know, more than just the obvious stuff. And they're probably not increasing the funding. 
No. <laughs> Another budget cut for me this year. Woo! <laughs> so excited. So that, you know, that didn't help. Uh, this doesn't help the process that it was supposed to be um, helpful to put the records online. Fewer people would come in and need our assistance to see those records, right? But the, the bad side of that was, oh, this VOR process, you know, there's not enough things that are in place that are guaranteed that, that redact that information. Um, so that's one of these, the reasons for the bill, and we're working on some other things that we think should narrow that down so that, you know, and that, that's kind of what I'm working towards, is how narrow can I get the number of documents that go into that VOR queue? If I can get it down to just a few, you know, then I, uh, you know, my pilot is over, I switch over, and it's not so painful. So we're working very hard on that, but we just, you know, right now that VOR queue can be anywhere from two to five days. It just really depends on the volume and the number of clerks we have, and we can't hire more clerks. So, so I've probably talked enough about that stuff, and I'm going to just let Richard talk a little bit about um, the tax seed sale process. Thank you. Passed these out earlier. Sorry. Oh, I'll do that, Richard. Go ahead and get started. She's a good fan. Of. <laughs> <laughs> As Linda was saying, we have uh, since about 2008, both our foreclosures and tax deed sales have been conducted online. Tax deeds completely online. Foreclosures every once in a while, due to uh, some specific situations or a specific request, uh, there is an occasional, but increasingly rare, in the courthouse sale for foreclosures, but the vast majority of those are conducted online as well. And one of the things that I think has made this uh, presentation necessary, and we're, we're doing it a couple of times a year now in partnership with the tax collector, is that the process is simple for anybody to participate. Uh, we have bidders from all over the world that uh, bid, and it's very easy to do, which means a lot of people jump in without a lot of knowledge. So uh, we thought if we are out there a little bit more, uh, providing the framework for how you do it, but also uh, when we give this to the public, and I've pared this down for this group, but half of the presentation is warnings and disclaimers because there's a lot, it's very easy to work through, but uh, if you're not paying attention or you don't have the knowledge, uh, there's some good pitfalls for you, <laughs> which may drive people to you, I don't know, but. Uh, both of those sales are online now. Our volume for foreclosures is about uh, 125 sales being scheduled a month. That's down from about 2,000 or so in uh, 2008, nine. And for uh, tax deeds is about 400 sales get scheduled every month and then our redemption rate, uh, which just pays the taxes before the sale is uh, held, is about 50%, so we're actually selling around 200 a month for tax deed sales. Uh, the tax deed sales process differs from the foreclosure one in that it's a non-judicial sale. It really starts with a, a lien uh, tax certificate that's sold by the tax collector in the year that the taxes become delinquent. So it's more around June of every year the tax collector sells the tax certificates, which are lien against the property, and the purchaser of that tax certificate is the, the winning bidder of it, is the uh, bidder that receives or places the, will accept the lowest amount of interest on the lien, it becomes the certificate holder. And the certificate holder has to hold that certificate for at least two years before the process can begin to force it to sale. The vast majority of those certificates are redeemed before they ever come to that part of the process, uh, and they'll just be, they'll receive their investment with the interest that they bid for. Tax certificates can be held up to seven years. After that, they're no good. They mean nothing for you. And the process, the most of the uh, governing process is found in Chapter 197 of the Florida Statutes for your reading pleasure. We're not going to go into too much detail about that. <laughs> so what the process, the high-level overview of the process looks like, starting with the uh, property value, uh, determination, tax, regular tax notices being mailed April 1st, any unpaid 
property taxes become delinquent and the tax collector publishes and holds a tax certificate sale. After that two year point, if the tax certificate is not redeemed, uh, the certificate holder can force the, the property to sale through a tax deed application process. They make that application with the tax collector who does some preparation work, orders a uh, ownership and encumbrance report, collects a deposit, uh, and then sends that all to the clerk to hold the sale and to provide uh, notice to the owner and interested parties. <clears throat> the tax collector sends to the clerk what we call a certification, includes all of the tax certificate amounts, the outstanding, any other outstanding tax certificates, uh, party information, this come from their records, from official records, from the property appraiser's office, any potential uh, lien holders or other interested parties are sent to the clerk's office for no the notice process. Uh, the ownership and encumbrance report includes some basic property information, where it's located, the street address, the legal description of the property, and copies of the records that made up the ownership and encumbrance report. They contract with a title company to prepare that document. And the certificate holder, in the beginning of this process, to apply for the tax deed sale, puts a 600, right now, a $600 deposit on file with the clerk for the clerk to proceed with mailing those notices and doing the rest of that process. Once the clerk receives that packet of information from the tax collector, then we can begin identifying all of the parties to receive notice, select a sale date, once we have the sale date, we can project out the interest because that interest from the certificate sale still accrues through the month of the actual tax deed sale. So once we have that, we can establish the opening bid amount. <clears throat> that opening bid amount is considered to be the certificate holder's bid. So if nobody else bid, no other third party bidders were participating in that particular auction, that certificate holder who may have just wanted the interest on the certificate will be the winning bidder of the property for all of the costs paid up to that point. It would not get any interest or anything like that. You would just be issued a tax deed. The clerk sends certified, registered, and regular mail. <clears throat> the tax deed process, uh, especially presented like this, is pretty straightforward. Some of the challenges have to do, most of the challenges have to do with notice. Uh, people who have moved, addresses that maybe not have gotten properly updated, errors that were never surfaced on the records uh, that have an ownership interest in the property but don't receive notice. So we take as much as we can from uh, court cases, from statutes, from best practices to ensure that our process for notice is as thorough as possible without investigating every case and looking for people. So we have added this year a courtesy, we call it a courtesy notice process on top of our statutory required notice. Uh, we automatically send a postcard by regular mail to all of the parties as well, a couple of days after the certified mail, just so that we have, we, we've done our best effort to make sure that somebody sees it. Florida owners or owners with Florida addresses are also served notice by the uh, sheriff of their county. And the clerk prepares that and sends that to those sheriffs and notice is published in the newspaper. We use the uh, Business Observer right now for the tax deed sale. After all of that's done, we transmit the sale information to the auction site, which is then available immediately to anybody. Whether you're registered as a bidder or not, you can view the information there. You have a little bit more access to detailed information if you are a registered bidder. The redemption can have a redemption can happen at any time from the time of the tax certificate sale through the time the clerk issues the tax deed. And there are times, I don't know why, but we'll have a tax deed purchaser ready to pay their final balance and the owner in the office at the same time trying to uh, stop that process and the clerk will take the redemption up to the point we record the or issue the deed. The redemption amount is includes that it is that opening bid amount, that first bid. It covers all of the investment of the tax certificate holder, plus that interest, all the fees, through the month of sale. <clears throat> Excuse me. To participate as a bidder, you have to register because all of the tax deed sales uh, are held online. You have to register through the uh, vendor's website. We use a company called Real Auction to host our auction sites 
for foreclosure and tax deeds. The tax deeds one is up here. Uh, I think in the end, in the resources, there's the foreclosure link as well. Both are available on the clerk's website. To register as a bidder, there's no charge. You can review the auction calendar. This is basic, the basic process of the bidder participation. Research properties starting. You can start your research through the auction site. There's links to the property appraiser's information for each property, link to the clerk's records, that packet of information that we received from the tax collector is available for everybody to see. Um, every record really that we have, other than some uh, maybe notes about a specific detail on a property, are made available as soon as we get them. There are really no special information on any of these cases that the public doesn't have automatic access to. In order to participate on a specific auction to place a bid, you have to, the bidder has to place a deposit with the clerk uh, beforehand. So we receive deposits all the time and they can be unattached to a specific sale. So once you're a registered bidder, you can come to the office or send the funds in, reapply the deposit to the bidder account, then they're that money is available anytime you want to make specific bids on any of these properties. Once a bid is placed, though, that deposit, 5% or $200, uh, whichever is greater, is deducted from the bidder account, applied to the opening bid if you're the winning bidder. If not, that money is uh, returned to your bidder account. The auction site uses a proxy bidding system, so it removes the necessity of participating live in the auction. The system keeps the bidder as the highest bidder up to your maximum bid, so in $100 increments. You don't have to log in on the day and time of the sale to participate if the bidder establishes the maximum amount. They, they would go on a particular property. The system will keep that person as the high bidder, starting with the opening bid, up to their maximum bid in $100 increments. So uh, after the auction closes, the, the bidder has 24 hours to make the uh, final payment to the clerk. And once that money is received, the clerk records the, um, the deed in the official records and mails, usually mails the tax deed to the winning bidder. <clears throat> I pared this down. We're not going to go through every step of the login process. It's a pretty straightforward process for anybody who's interested. This is what the homepage looks like of the auction site. Uh, the on-screen prompts are, are very intuitive. That is a separate site from the, the clerk's website, but it is accessible by link through the clerk's website. Talked a little bit about that. The tax deeds recorded right after the sale. Uh, the proof of publication and certificate of mailing are recorded together in the official records. That really marks the end of the sale and is considered to be basically evidence that the, the process was completed as uh, directed by statute. Uh, the, the clerk is certifying that we mailed certified mail notices to all interested parties and the sale process is concluded and the clerk really has no further uh, ac actions to perform as, as regards to the sale. <clears throat> the purchase uh, money that the clerk has received is then refunded to the certificate holder. Now they're made good uh, on their investment plus the interest. And a frequent question from our public, especially the ones that watch the late night infomercials and uh, want to get rich quick on these property transactions, is they, uh, the cook really has no information extra than what we've put already in the file and can't help you evict anybody, can't help uh, put the house back in place that was condemned that you didn't realize. Uh, it's a frequent question uh, for us. Buyer's remorse is, can be strong in the tax deed process. <laughs> Especially, we, the, we have a high volume in the county of tax deeds. We're probably number one right now. Uh, the, a lot of that's just because of our market, but also we have a lot of vacant lands, which are uh, probably our biggest, the biggest chunk of our inventory is the vacant property, um, which usually those are relatively straightforward. It's a little messy sometimes with the houses. The amount of uh, money, the difference between the opening bid cost and the opening bid price and the winning bid, what, what we actually receive for the tax deed, is considered surplus. It's held primarily for the benefit of the previous owner who's lost their property through the taking process, uh, and the clerk is responsible for dispersing that according to priorities. 
Uh, it does often get paid, or some portion of it will often get paid to the previous owner, but the clerk has to hold it and pay. Uh, usually, if there's a house, there's usually a mortgage. Usually, that mortgage is in first place to receive that surplus. If in that scenario, the, the clerk will usually disperse those funds there after payment to government agencies for the code enforcement liens, things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, and then after the mortgage holders or other lien holders, previous owners, beneficiaries are in line to receive that. There's also a relatively new process. The money used to be held by the county and then would achieve to the county if it was unclaimed. Now the clerk remits that to the state uh, in the, following the unclaimed funds process after uh, being held the full calendar year. We have, I think, seven million, right around seven million dollars right now. Uh, for of surplus. That's a completely made up number. I have to find out how much it is. <laughs> it's somewhere around there. <laughs> Some of the ch uh, interesting challenges uh, for the from the tax deed sale process that we've seen. Generally, I, I left this one in here. This was my final in our last public presentation. It was my final warning. Uh, to urge caution to anybody who wanted to jump in without knowledge. If I left it in just for the fun, I think some of you probably would get a kick out of it. Uh, some of the interesting challenges we see, generally speaking though, this process goes without major incident. Um, some of it though, we really wouldn't know because the clerk has no uh, interaction with the process afterwards other than the surplus payment. But we've had cases where the uh, interested bidder drove by the property a uh, few days before making a bid and said that they wanted it, made the final payment, went to go and stick their flag on it and the house was no longer there, didn't realize that there was a code enforcement uh, demolition lien in place or order. Government agency liens, utility liens, things like that that could affect the uh, winning bidder. Bankruptcy is another one. Um, challenge only because if you are the certificate holder intending to force the property to sale, then you might have to just wait until that's settled. No bidders at the sale, so uh, if you're the certificate holder who only wants interest, and you're happy to sit on it for a couple of years, but there's nobody else interested in that property, you've just been sitting and waiting with that investment tied up, and now you're the lucky owner of that piece of land in Lehigh that you had no intention of uh, putting your tent on. Occasionally, the uh, a tax deed can be overturned, uh, it's a voiding the tax deed. Uh, we've had one or two of them. Generally when there's an issue uh, after the sale due to notice issues, uh, somebody, the, an owner not getting notified, there is a process in place for voluntarily conveying the property to the county and then the county uh, deeding the property back to the previous owner and whatever funds are available to refund the purchaser uh, would then be uh, dispersed that way. That's how they normally go, just because if you're the winning bidder uh, who's facing that situation with the property that may be affected, it, it could, it's going to give you trouble quieting the title on it, and it's probably better for you to voluntarily do it, though it could be challenged. But anytime we have an issue, which we always have one or two pending, um, they're usually voluntarily reconveyed to the county. We've had situations where foreclosure and tax deed sale were scheduled for the same day for the same piece of property. <laughs> I don't even know how that actually works out as far as what effect either of those have, but both go simultaneously. The same clerks could be doing the same thing, but they're very different, separate processes. And uh, the other is people living there don't want to leave. When you, are, when you show up in your, with your shiny new deed, we're not happy to go. <laughs> Linda will sometimes go and try to muscle them out of there, but it's... <laughs> uh, some of the resources available for uh, if you want any more information. All of the stuff that we talked about, including our full presentation that we gave recently uh, in conjunction with the tax collector, is available on the leadclerk.org website. Links to all of the other information that I talked about or mentioned is available there. In your handout, there's the, the URLs for all of the sites that we use. <clears throat> in, those, in those auction sites, there's frequently asked questions, procedures on how to participate, uh, things like that. That's really all I have. Any questions?
Yeah, I've seen on the auction site on occasion the opening bid is substantially higher than what taxes are owed. It's like the taxes are yep. eight thousand dollars and the opening bid is twenty five thousand dollars. Yeah. Where does that come from? When so the the person that holds the certificate that is now ripe for application for tax deed, they usually a property that is delinquent the one year. So the tax certificate is held, sale is held every year. They have to hold it for two years. By the time that certificate is ripe for tax deed sale, another, at least one other tax certificate has been sold probably to somebody else. So the first part of that process, if you are forcing the sale, is to purchase or redeem all outstanding certificates on that. So now you are the holder of all of those certificates. All of that is combined together for your for the opening bid. So you're going to you're going to get that back if the property sells. So that's separate though from that one year's outstanding taxes. Well, I understand that I've seen it where it's been substantially different. Like even if you added up five years worth of taxes, all of a sudden you see, you know, maybe it should be twelve thousand dollars. Yeah. Like the opening bid is thirty seven thousand dollars. Like Yeah, there's a other... there's a few there are a few variables that can, can do that. One is time because if the sale is stalled for any reason, whether the, the applicant or the certificate holder waited longer instead of maybe doing it right away at the two years, that interest is accruing up to the seven years. That's, that's a big portion of it. Notice is another one. Some of the properties we have have a lot of interested parties that then ups the, the sheriff services, $40 a pop, things like that. So uh, that is all included into that opening bid. And no other leads are included except for that's IRS correct. and that, I mean, except for the taxes and whatever the interest. Correct. Fees and the cost of uh, holding the sale. That's the only thing that's in the opening bid. So it would be some kind of combination of those amounts that would make that difference between the outstanding taxes and the opening bid. Any other questions? How many participants are there usually in any particular auction? We don't really watch that because it's it's not um, this is not information that we need. There's nothing to do about it. It's okay. really automated that. Um, and it's not real visible to yeah. us. Yeah. Okay. Really, you know, we can't really see the bidding process. Um, the yeah, behind the scenes. I mean, I guess we. I, I don't know. I think the, the vendor has some you know tools that where they, they can see who's bidding could. and what's happening behind the scenes, but we don't really see that as the clerk. Right. It doesn't affect our process at all, and it's something that. Yeah. We really don't do anything with the proxy bidding. We want that to be uh, straightforward and provide a level of confidence that when you put your proxy bid in there, if you were the highest one, you're going to get it and there's no shenanigans going on like it was in the uh, live auctions. <laughs> we had to have babysitters all the time with that because you never knew what was going on there. So we try to, I mean, it's, we, we put the information out there. It works the same way every single sale. So. I don't really know the answer, but we have bidders from all over the place, but we don't really know. Are they, we don't collect those bids. It's all done through the system. Are they always sold at the auction? No. Okay, so some go unsold. But some do, yeah. And that, it varies. Uh, I think our, there have been a lot more recently. Every sale, uh, there's at least one or two uh, that are we consider struck to the applicant. So they have the property now for all the costs that they've they've uh, expended. And do any of the certificates ever go unsold? They do. Okay. That process, uh, every year the books close on it and the process of it includes the certificate sale, uh, but any certificates that are not sold are struck to the county. And the county is now the certificate holder and the process is actually the same. So the, the county in two years <coughs> would uh, apply for tax deed as well to recoup those costs. And that happens a lot. There's a lot of certificates. Any other questions? <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, our next meeting is on June 29th, and Judge Delaney will be coming down and introducing the new bankruptcy clerk of court, um, Cheryl Loesch. All right. Thank you.